In this session, we're going to be looking at demonization in the Synoptic Gospels. And when I say Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, so Synoptic means just a synopsis or a summary of the main parts. So we're going to be looking at those four Gospels. Uh, and so what we see in them, that is, one-third of the chapters have at least one account of Jesus overcoming demons. We also see that casting out demons was very commonplace. It was normal part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Also, there are no less than 24 accounts of deliverance from evil spirits recorded in the Bible. We see also that each gospel has Jesus commanding his disciples to cast out evil spirits. We see also deliverance was a primary method used to demonstrate the kingdom of God, the power of the kingdom of God. Also, the accounts of deliverance from evil spirits are for us to learn how to do the same. So we take a, a snapshot of how Jesus cast out evil spirits, how the apostles and how the apostle Paul cast out evil spirits, and we learn and we glean from them. Also, we see that Jesus util utilized power encounters to drive out demons, as did all of his followers. That is the New Testament pattern that we are supposed to replicate today when we cast out spirits. We also see that uh, uh, Jesus and his followers, they did not use incantations like what the enchanters and shaman of the day used. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a little snapshot, a little background history of uh, non-Christian history of the enchanters that were going around casting out demons as well. So uh, since ancient times, cultures have sought to invoke or to placate demon spirits to try to appease them so that they won't attack them or try to ask them to come and lend them assistance for for different various reasons in babylon we know that pagan priests they would perform elaborate rituals and the priest they would take a, a clay figure he would make a clay figure in the form of what he thought the demon looked like then they would smash that clay figure and they believed that that would destroy uh that demon they believed that it would rid the demon from the person that was, was being tormented. We also know that from 1400 years before Christ till 300 years after Christ, there was a, a, uh, a channeler, a person who was called the, the Oracle at Delphi in, in, in Greece. You can actually go on uh, Google Maps and you can zoom in on this particular location where this, uh, uh, the, the Oracle was supposed to have uh, been seated where they would... Uh, speak with the dead and get information because the politicians and the military leaders and others consulted the dead through these oracles, these individuals that were sitting, sitting there at that, this particular temple. And today we call them channelers. And so this is an image. So if you go on Google Maps, you could ask, actually zoom really close down at this, this particular site. And it was usually women of 50 years old and older that were the prominent channelers at this time that would speak with the dead on behalf of the politicians or military leaders or anybody else that for some reason wanted to speak with the dead. So there's a, an image of what it's believed that they look like. And here's another one. So that is that. And now, now also in Judaism, also they were, there were people that would cast out evil spirits. We read about that uh, in the New Testament where Jesus says, your, 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 your children, your sons and daughters, your, your, your sons, they also cast out evil spirits. So we, knew, we know that that was in place. And in Jewish, uh, Jewish mythology, there was a Nebuch, is a malicious or a possessive spirit. And so those are the ones that these uh, uh, itinerant, exorcists would drive out of people, out of the people who, the, the, of the nation of Israel. We know that in uh, uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 20, we see that seven sons of a man by the name of Sceva, uh, they were, were traveling around looking for people who were demonized and then they would perform rituals and incantations to get those demons out of them. We also know that witches and Satanists and black magicians and, and others, they claim to use rituals developed by King Solomon. And it just so happens that Freemasonry also has links back to these rituals that King Solomon uh, had. Josephus, the historian uh, during the age of Jesus and following Jesus up to the, about the first century, end of the first century, he wrote about various forms of uh, Jewish exorcisms. 
We also read in the Dead Sea Scrolls that uh, David composed songs and music for, uh, for driving out evil spirits. Now that isn't uh, the Bible, but we do know that uh, there, there is these ancient documents that that was at least a belief. And, uh, but we do have scriptures that proves that David did that. And in 1 Samuel 20, verse 23, it said David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. So a troubling or tormenting spirit would come upon King Saul from time to time. And, and David would play his lyre and possibly sing songs too. And the evil spirit would leave. So there we have a biblical uh, example of how music can be used to uh, torment these evil spirits and force them to leave. So that is in, in the Jewish uh, religion, there was exorcists. Also in Hinduism, we know that uh, this religion is just filled with demons and demigods. It just, it's what they do. They, they worship these demons all the time. So these spirits, they will attack the living if they are not appropriately appeased. And so what you'll see is that I've been to India. I've been on the island of Bali uh, where it's predominantly uh, Hindu and every morning they have all of their offerings out for these gods and these spirits to appease them so that they will receive a blessing and that they won't be attacked. You can see a, a few pictures here of some of these offerings that they offer to the gods and, and their, their prayers are that they often pray and they, and they burn incense to these spirits as well. Also in the religion of Islam, they also have their uh, uh, exorcists. Uh, they had a, this, uh, uh, the jinn is what they call them. It's, it, they're led by Iblis. Iblis is kind of like the Satan uh, and for Islam. And uh, so these jinn and genies are spirits that inhabit the unseen world. Uh, now, when I was a missionary in Indonesia, what I saw is that uh, I, I would get on, uh, I, for, for part of my language learning, I would take a newspaper and I'd read the newspaper. And every once in a while, I'd read an article about, how a, a high school classroom, all the women or young ladies would just become overwhelmed by these demon powers and they would just go crazy. And I mean, just screaming and yelling and falling on the ground, tearing at their hair and pulling at their clothes and ripping their clothes. And, and, and uh, I, I, I thought I was maybe misreading it because, you know, my language at the, learning at that time was just, just developing. And so I, I had a Muslim man. He was a principal of a high school. He would come to my home for a few times a week and I would, I would uh, learn from him. And I, and I showed him this article from the newspaper. I go, what is this? Uh, the, what is, 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 am I understanding this right? That in, at different times, uh, evil spirits would just invade a high school and all the girls in the high school would just go wacko, you know, he's, and he goes, yep, that happens from time to time. And I go, and, uh, and uh, so I was, I was just really amazed because it was just common for them. It is out in the open and they talk about it. And, uh, and so then they will call a, uh, an imam from, from the local mosque and, the, and he will come and he will perform his ritual to uh, cast the demons out so they'll leave these young ladies alone. And now I asked that Muslim high school teacher, I go, well, why is it only the girls? Why don't the guys um, have that same problem? Why don't the demons uh, overwhelm them? And he goes, he said that uh, the, the women get affected by him because they have weak minds. So that is the mindset of, of in, the, in the Islamic religion, uh, that the women have a weaker uh, disposition, so to speak, than what men do. That's why they are able to be overcome by these demon powers, and the men were not. That was his explanation. So when I was in Indonesia, I would just investigate because I knew I was up against really powerful demonic spirits all the time. And, uh, and so I would investigate. I would go to these uh, witch doctors. They called them dukun. So I would go to the dukun and I would extract information from them. And they were more than happy to talk to me. They were, they were pleased that I was interested. So here's one, one of the men that I would go to. He was selling his paraphernalia along the street. I would go there and I also go to these I would call them uh, um, psychics, or they, these, uh, they were able to foretell the future. And, and uh, they, this one man would use this sword right here, and uh, he would use that sword for divination. So you can see the man holding his sword there. So that is in uh, the Islamic region. We also know that in the American Indians, they also had their uh, shaman. They're witch doctors, and uh, so these witch doctors were, and other animals, they, they invite spirits into their bodies to enhance their powers, whether it's to heal as well as to send curses on their enemies. 
So uh, animism, just to make it clear, is it's a religious belief that, that perceives all things, animals, plants, rocks, rivers, uh, weather systems, uh, human handiwork, and perhaps even words are animated and contain life. There's spirit in everything. That's what they believe. And so there's a, a revival movement in Indonesia ever since we've been there in 2010 is, is when it started and it's still ongoing now. And at the end of March in 2020, there was 29 of these animists that came to Christ. So it's an ongoing movement. Uh, uh, I know the leaders that are standing right here in, in this, uh, in this uh, little stream and th these two men that are baptizing these guys. I know these guys. You know, I've, I've spent time with them out there in the jungles. And so uh, they're breaking down the powers of darkness. And also we know in American religion, these animists, uh, here's some Apache mountain spirit dancers, and here's a witch doctor or what they call a medicine man. And here's a more modern uh, medicine woman, I guess you could call that. So you can see it's just it's, it's throughout the, the, the world, this demonic influence. So in the Synoptic Gospels, we see that Jesus was directly engaging these powers of darkness, but he was doing it in a way that was manifesting the power of the kingdom of God. So there was a demonstration of spiritual power that Jesus brought, and it brought him fame, it brought him crowds, and it brought him authenticity. It authenticized gave him authenticity about what he was saying. And, and he said about this, he says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. If I'm, Jesus is specifically saying, I have the power to drive out evil spirits through the, through, through the power that the, the God Almighty has given to me. So this is evidence of the kingdom of God that is here. And then his fame went throughout Syria. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and, and those who were demon possessed and epileptics and paralytics and, and he healed them. So I want to make this real clear here what it says. Jesus healed epileptics and he drove out demons. Jesus healed those who were lame and he healed those in, uh, that were uh, paralyzed. He healed those who were blind. He healed those who were mute and couldn't hear, but he drove out evil spirits. I want to make that really clear because there are Christian writers that try to dilute the Word of God, and they say that uh, Jesus was really just healing people of mental illnesses because they do not want to acknowledge that there is such a thing as demonization. So it's this even uh, conservative Christians that are writing such things and, and it's, it's just appalling that they, they would s stoop to that, uh, uh, just diluting the Word of God like that. So this responsibility and power that Jesus had to drive out evil spirits was passed on to those who believe, like it says in Mark 16, 17, where Jesus says, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. So this responsibility to conduct this ministry and the power to do it was given to his 12 apostles. We see here it says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. He also gave this responsibility and the authority to this, the 70 disciples. Maybe in your translation, the Bible translation that you have, they might have 72. So either 70 or 72. And in Luke 10, 1, it says, and, af and after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So the authority and the responsibility was granted to his followers. Now we want to look at the Matthew, Mark, and Luke specifically on the number of times that we see the, the, this mention of the demonic. In Matthew, 25% of the chapters show Jesus casting out demons or speaking with Satan or uh, with demons or, or uh, something about the demonic, something about uh, Satan's kingdom. He's, he's talking about it frequently. We see it in verse, or chapters 4, 8, 9, 10, 12, 15, and 17 in the Gospel of Matthew. And then in Mark, 
44% of the chapters show Jesus casting out demons or speaking with or about the demonic. And it's found in chapters 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 16. So now Mark contains the Great Commission that shows that the first sign of a believer is that they will cast out demons. We read it here and he says, And he said to them, Go into all the world. This is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. So this is the package of the Great Commission. The responsibility that has been placed upon every one of the followers of Jesus Christ. Those who believe in him. Now we go into the Gospel of Luke. 33% of the chapters in Luke show Jesus casting out demons or speaking with or about the demonic. And these are the chapters. It's 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 13. Now, in the book with the name of In the Name of Jesus, Exorcism Among Early Christians by Graham Twelfth Tree, um, he's, a, he's a distinguished professor uh, of New Testament at the School of of divinity at Regent University and what he says uh, is that all healing involves God's adversary being defeated so there is the the power of God coming to make a public demonstration that the kingdom of God has come to earth we also see that he says uh, as exorcism was included in Luke's use of the phrase signs and wonders readers would assume that exorcism was included in the signs and wonders of Jesus's followers so Jesus' followers did everything that Jesus did. He told them and he showed them how to conduct ministry and then he allowed them to do it because we just read that one verse where he says he sent them in front of him, before him, to all the towns and villages that he was going to go. So he, he showed them how to heal the sick, preach the gospel and cast out demons and then he says, now you go do it. Then I'm going to come to your, your town where you're at and I'm going to follow up with you and, and to ask you questions on how it went. He expected them to do the same. Also, Graham Twelftree in his book, uh, he says that um, also since exorcism and the kingdom of God were so closely tied in the ministry of Jesus, readers could assume that exorcism was involved when Luke says that the early Christians proclaimed the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 11 verse 20 where, where we read, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. We know the kingdom of God is here, the power of the kingdom, when we see these signs and wonders and miracles of physical healings being taking place, mental and emotional healing taking place, and spirits being forced to leave a person who is being tormented by them. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, we read from uh, this one account where it says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, I know people that do not want to uh, talk much about demons because they're afraid that uh, uh, some, they're going to be accused of uh, seeing a demon behind every bush, whereas Jesus saw a demon in front of every bush. And uh, so, uh, so they don't want to talk about the, the demons being subject to us. They just want to say, we're not supposed to talk about it. We're supposed to rejoice that our names are written in heaven to the diminishing and to the neglect of doing anything about the people that are tormented by demons. But what this passage here in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20 is really doing for us is it's pre presenting us with a template uh, for the defeat of demonic powers. We see that the demons are subject to them. They were subject to those 70 uh, followers of Jesus, his disciples. The demons must surrender. They are a defeated army. And this defeated army at this era, era was humiliated. Whenever there was battles back during this time period, they humiliated the army. They would march them and put them on display, the defeated, in a procession. 
That's, that's what they do. And that's what we want to do with the powers of darkness. We want to display the power of God triumphing over the kingdom of darkness, putting them on open display, giving opportunities for people to give their testimonies of being set free and delivered from demonic powers, not hide it and rob God from His glory. Now let's look at this frequency and the importance that we see taking place with uh, this ministry of deliverance from evil spirits. The deliverance ministry of Jesus is not only mentioned, but it is highlighted as an integral part of the miracles that establish Jesus as the Messiah and God. It is a very prominent part of Jesus' ministry. And nobody can argue that exorcism was a minor or secondary part of Jesus' ministry or that it was a rare occurrence. It was not a rare occurrence. Every town and village that Jesus went into, he was casting out evil spirits. He was healing the sick and he was preaching the gospel. So also this, is, this was also a reason why the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus because he, he had so much fame. Uh, and, and power and recognition by the people, and they wanted to kill him because of that. Now let's take a little snapshot at a, that the New Testament uh, model for evangelism. We do have a specific uh, teaching session on this, but I just want to touch on it here to like a refresher. This is about Philip the evangelist in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through 8, where it says, But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So here we have Philip. He had a crowd following him. Because of these miracles that were being performed, healing miracles, people being set free from demon powers, people were eager to listen to what this man had to say. And then he preached the gospel and it was just an amazing move of the Holy Spirit and many people turned to the Lord. We also see in Acts chapter 16 with the Apostle Paul. And where it says, now it happened as we went to prayer, this is Paul and his group, uh, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, and it became a, an irritation to Paul. So uh, what he did was in verse 18, it says, But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. So that is how Paul dealt with it. Also at another instance where in uh, Acts chapter 19, we see Paul, he had power to drive out evil spirits as well as to heal even though he wasn't present where we read, uh, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So here we see handkerchiefs or aprons that Paul wore when he worked were taken and they were given to the people that were sick. Maybe they were placed on them. We don't really know how they used them, but we just know that they were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left the people and the evil spirits also went out of the people who were being uh, demonized, possessed and controlled by them. Now I want to make it very clear here, this, this next thing we want to talk about. When we say the word demon-possessed, when we read in the Bible the phrase or the wording demon-possessed or demonized or have a spirit or being with spirits, evil spirits, it means literally that. They are possessed by evil spirits. There is an evil spirit on the inside of them. So that's what we read here. Demon possession means demon possession. When the Bible mentions demon possession, it is not an allegorical description of human suffering. There are people out there, writers that have written about this, trying to uh, diminish the, the, the actual wording of the Bible and just saying that these people had just uh, some kind of human suffering. This is just all allegorical. It is not. 
The Bible is infallible. It is incapable of error. We believe that. We believe that it is inspired by God. It is God-breathed. We see that in 2 Timothy 3.16. So the gospel writers were writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, not from a lack of understanding about psychological disorders. So Jesus differentiated between physiological conditions and demons. It was a very clear difference. He knew the difference. And so what some of these, they call themselves Christians that are writing about this, are saying that Jesus was uneducated. He was uninformed. He didn't understand modern psychology. And so he thought that these people were uh, possessed by spirits. And really, they just had mental illnesses. And that is just a, a diminishing and a, and a watering down of the Word of God. Jesus healed those with sicknesses, handicaps, and diseases. He, phys you know, he healed those physical conditions. But when it came to demons, he cast them out. For example, in Mark chapter 5, with the demonized man at Gadara, there isn't the slightest suggestion that Jesus referred to that man's supernatural strength or his self-injurious behavior of cutting himself, which is uh, self-mutilation, as coming from a mental state. It came from a legion of demons. So what we learn from uh, this session is that the casting out of spirits, uh, it, it is biblical. It, is, it was part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. It is what Jesus commanded his disciples to do. It is part of the Great Commission. That mandate has never been withdrawn. The mandate of going and telling the whole world about Jesus and proclaiming the good news has never been withdrawn. Also, that rider that has been attached to it of casting out evil spirits is still in place as well. We have a clear command and instruction of Scripture to go forth and do it in His name until the end of the ages. We're not at the end of the age yet, so that command is still in place. So this is the end of this session, and uh, we just want to encourage you to keep watching these videos in preparation for our deliverance seminars.